what do you do when the bottom falls out? I mean, it's one thing when um, it's, a, it's a grocery sack uh, full of groceries and it, and it falls out. You, sh- you shed a few tears. You drop a few uh, word bombs that you would not say around the kids. And then you get the mop out. But what do you do when the bottom falls out of your life, your career, your family security, your health? Uh, What do you do when things go from bad to worse? Uh, I know y'all didn't come to church to even want to think about that, but we, we know for everyone the unthinkable can happen and does happen. And followers of Jesus are not insulated from life crisis. In fact, uh, the bottom often falls out for us too. Sometimes actually because we're followers of Christ. Jesus said in, in, in John 17 that the world at times will actually hate you because of me. Every now and then I run across a, a Christ follower who has never really face trials, and some would call them fortunate. I might call them unprepared. Uh, I said it last week, trials can be a way of preparing you for the next battle. And we are in a spiritual battle here in Babylon. And uh, we got to be battle ready if we're going to survive. A teenage boy enters a hospital in respiratory distress, and the doctor suspects the problem is drug-related. And the boy's Christian parents can't believe that. They've never known their son to consume anything stronger than a Red Bull. But the doctor turns out to be right. Uh, A lay leader in a church is arrested for shoplifting a bottle of wine. And the police report says he took the bottle into the restroom where he finished it off. How, how, how could he make such a foolish choice? Later it's revealed there's all these job pressures and personal medical problems and family tensions and uh, a daughter's recently diagnosed brain tumor. You know, the hidden wine binge was just a, a desperate attempt to es- escape it all for a while. Uh, A seven-year-old girl is diagnosed with having leukemia, and her Christian father has been laid off from his job. These are all real stories, by the way. All of them involve real Christians. All of them, you could say, have parallels to the second chapter of Daniel. That's because the bottom is about to fall out for Daniel. And if you listen to last week's message, you know it's already been a rough start for Daniel in chapter one, even though he'd been born into um, Israel's nobility, uh, Daniel's homeland is conquered. And it's conquered by a psychopath who who has taken the best and the brightest captive. Um, On the upside, because of Daniel's gifting and his background, he gets to be part of this best and the brightest crew. And he's, he's trained in the king's palace for the king's service. And at the end of that training, he's found to be 10 times wiser than the wise men of Babylon. And some of you churchy folks may remember that Joseph had a similar story, a former slave, a prisoner. He, he, he gets, earns these same duties under Pharaoh. He'd risen above the circumstances and things are looking up. But in all act twos, Empire Strikes Back, Lord of the Rings, the Two Towers, things, things go from bad to worse. And except this is a real story with real lives at stake. So the king has this dream, and he's really troubled by it. In fact, it outright scared him. And so he calls his wise men to find out what the dream meant and says, uh, wise men say to him, tell us the dream, O king, and we shall interpret it for you. His, his enchanters and sorcerers said, and Nebuchadnezzar's like, uh, if you're so wise and you're tapped into the supernatural, you tell me what I dreamed because I don't want you giving me no phony baloney improv class kind of stuff, Okay. And they're like, uh, humana, humana, humma, word salad, uh, excuse, excuse. Their failure 
and excuses actually so angered the king that he ordered all the men, all the wise men of the kingdom to be killed. Oh, and look who had just been promoted to wise man, Daniel, 10 times more wise and capable than any of the others. So the commander of the king's guard goes looking for Daniel, sword in one hand, uh, execution orders in the other, and the bottom has fallen out for Daniel. It's, it's over. After much suffering, Daniel had clawed his way back to some semblance of a decent life. And with one irrational edict from a narcissistic, narcissistic from a yeah. prideful king, <laughs> the artwork for this series says, you know, dare to be a Daniel. And uh, I know one person caught that reference. It's an old Sunday school song. But I mean it. I mean it for me. When the bottom falls out for Jonathan, will I take the, any number of immature, selfish, easy outs, or will I dare to be a Daniel and act out what faithfulness to God looks like in the midst of a crisis? What should we do? when the bottom falls out. I think Daniel provides a, like an interesting template for us. Uh, Daniel's first spiritual response to his crisis appears in verse 17 and 18. It says, Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We'll talk about that next week. And he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. First thing, when the bottom falls out, Daniel falls to his knees. Uh, uh, Daniel's response to a crisis begins with prayer. In, In verse 16, he asks the king for extra time. For what? So he can cook up an escape plan or, or delay the inevitable or get his affairs in order? No, to assemble his trusted prayer team and get to praying. We're going to have a prayer summit tonight at 6.30, a quarterly thing that, that is going to be part of the rhythm of NAC, and, and we're going to get to praying tonight. And, and maybe it doesn't strike you as significant that Daniel's first response to crisis was prayer. You know, we think yeah, biblical people are supposed to pray. Until you remember how you respond in a crisis, how I respond, how many of us uh, don't pick that as our first response, how often it is the so-called practical option that we start with, you know, calls to lawyers and doctors and accountants and crisis management. Uh, Maybe it's even our first response is some form of escapism, you know, a stiff drink, quick puff. Or we're smart people. We can, we can problem solve this. Heck, Daniel is 10 times wiser than anyone else. He could have put his mind to this problem. How can I play for time? How can I work the angles? How can I curry favor, pull some strings? And, and Daniel had the same options that we do in a crisis. He could have resorted to his intelligence, his influence, his resources. But his first response is to turn to God. Daniel chose prayer as his first response. What, what is prayer after all? It's just simply the confession of our need for God. Daniel urged his companions to pray for God's mercy because he knew they were powerless to undo this king's decree, powerless to avoid the consequences. Daniel's request for prayer is a confession that these young men required a greater power than their own. It's the, it's the Christian origins of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, the belief that this disease is bigger than the individual and one needs to submit to a higher power greater than ourselves. Now, don't, don't misunderstand me either. That, um, that kind of first response, a petition for God's intervention, doesn't 
require us to become irresponsible about our duties either, about planning, about making a doctor's appointment, you know, getting legal advice, whatever that is. But what prayer does is it acknowledges, Lord, apart from you, I can do nothing. On my own, Lord, I can't fix this. I can't heal this wound. I can't go back in time. I can't clean up this mess. Without you, I can't put my life back together. God, you've got to take control. If any good is even going to come out of this uh, situation, it's got to be from you, Lord. Use me if you will, but, but only you, Lord, are able to do what seems impossible right now. So we recognize um, that before we pick up the phone to make that crucial call or, or uh, call that meeting or make that spreadsheet or form a crisis management team, we fall on our knees and we ask God for help. He's the only true crisis manager. And, and by their very nature, our prayers are acknowledgments that we, that we cannot provide what we need most. It's acknowledging our weakness. Uh, some of y'all struggle with that. With prayer, we acknowledge our dependence upon God's grace, our trust in His heart. It, it's like in, intentionally pushing ourselves out of the way so that God's ways can be revealed. We live in a culture of so-called a self-made men and women, you know, your destiny is your own to make. Uh, work hard, study hard, be smart, take your vitamins, you'll be successful. Um, so when the bottom falls out of our lives, our reflex reaction is to focus on our self-supplied solutions. We're so accustomed to depending on our own resources that we neglect seeking God's supply when we need it the most. Sometimes my prayerlessness is like an ugly reminder, a gauge of how much I really think our God makes a difference in our life. And I just repent of that today. And if there's anything good to come out of a crisis, often, often it's the means in which God might use to get our prayer life back on track. I see the lovely uh, Tara is here and her and John wouldn't have asked for this journey of health issues. And God certainly didn't cause it. But maybe in his goodness, he will redeem it somehow. What the enemy meant for evil, God will redeem and um. Bring her closer to him. How many have discovered that in their own life, in fact? Yeah, yeah. You might have this fear to seek God in a time of crisis because you haven't been seeking him much before. And you think God that, you know, is up there going, oh, well, look who's back. Hmm? <laughs> haven't seen you for a while. Uh, interesting you come running to me now. Maybe I'm the one who's busy now. I ever think of that? No, no, God is not like that. Oh, he longs for us to turn to him. And, and Daniel shows us that there is never a wrong time to pray. Daniel gathers his friends and together for a focused time of prayer after this crisis comes. Any time is the right time to pray. Now, the second thing Daniel does in this chapter as a response to the bottom falling out is even way more counterintuitive than prayer. I would say it's even contrarian to our human nature. Here's, here's what it says, verse 19. That night the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. He said, praise the name of God forever and ever, for he has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and, acknowledge, and knowledge to the scholars. He reveals deep and mysterious things and knows what lies hidden in darkness, though he is surrounded by light. I thank and praise you, God, 
of my ancestors. For you have given me wisdom and strength. You have told me what we asked of you and revealed to us what the king demanded. In the midst of his crisis, Daniel offers praise and thanksgiving to God. Daniel responds to pressure with praise and worship. Wait, 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 you're saying. He, he got the answer to his prayer that night. That's why he's praising. Yeah, only if you think the crisis is over for him. It's easy to praise God when you get all the answers, but you need to know that even though he got the dream interpretation supernaturally from God, we're going to find out that the dream and interpretation is profoundly bad news and threatening for this king. And so Daniel found himself facing maybe an even more threatening crisis because he knew what the king's dream meant. And Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed of this enormous, dazzling statue. Its head was made of gold. This is, part, this is his dream. The chest and arms were silver. Uh, the belly and thighs were bronze. The legs were iron. Uh, the feet were iron and clay. And in this dream, a rock cut without human hands grew large and then struck the statue and pulverized it to dust, which the wind swept away. And without any prompting, Daniel was able to relate to the king this entire dream, scene for scene. The rub is that Daniel had to also tell the king what the dream meant. And the interpretation Daniel had to share with this bloodthirsty king is recorded for us. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was to be split up it would be replaced by another kingdom, one after another. Nebuchadnezzar's golden rule in Babylon would be succeeded by the rule of the uh, Medo uh, Parisian Empire, a silver era, not quite as lustrous, which would be conquered by Greece, an empire of great strength that would not shine as bright, which would be succeeded by Rome, an empire of iron and clay, Stronger, yet, yet made of many different ethnicities, so it, you couldn't hold together. And in, in later chapters of his book, Daniel will be even more specific about the succession of, of kingdoms. But the immediate message for Nebuchadnezzar is embarrassingly clear for this authoritarian who probably, you know, obsessed with legacy. Eventually, all the king possessed and had built would be destroyed and scattered like dust. So we put ourselves in Daniel's place. You ever hear the expression, don't shoot the messenger? Uh, it was coined because of situations exactly like this, because of evil kings with no impulse control. Uh, and there is already a death sentence on Daniel's head. The commander of the guard, you know, sword in hand, is at his side, and this young prophet is supposed to tell evil King Nebuchadnezzar that he and everything he stands for in time will be, you know, giving the message is neither easy or safe. So this answered prayer hasn't exactly absolved all of Daniel's problems. Sometimes that's how God works, how his provision works, in phases and in stages. Are you prepared to keep saying yes to God as he just gives you the next step? There, there are three reasons that Daniel could still praise. The first one, even though Daniel does not know how everything's going to work out in the future, there's already evidence that God cares right now for Daniel, the present. God has revealed Nebuchadnezzar's dream, no other wise man in the kingdom was able to do that. He's provided the interpretation. So Daniel praised God for, for the good he could see, despite the grace that was not you know, yet fully revealed. Can, can we do that as a church? Can we praise God for where we can see God at work, even if the full plan hasn't been revealed? The second reason Daniel could praise was that the young prophet could remember God's goodness in the past. 
We can praise God for how he's been faithful in the past. You know, the first chapter of Daniel revealed the faithfulness of God that preserved him to that point. It's a familiar pattern. You know, God often points us to past provision to grant us reassurance in our present circumstances. You know, when Joshua um, assumed leadership of Israel entering into the promised land, he reminded God's people of God's faithfulness under Moses. When Peter addressed his countrymen before the challenges of beginning a, a, a New Testament church, he reminded them of God's faithfulness to his promises. When, when the church faced persecution, the writer of Hebrews reminded this, these exiles of God's faithfulness amidst suffering generations that had preceded them. And the past can provide just ample reasons for praising God, even if the present is troubling and unclear. When Daniel offered praise to the God of my fathers, the prophet was calling upon God's past faithfulness to strengthen his present. Can we do that as a church? Remind ourselves how God has been faithful to knack lo these 38 years to teach us that uh, he's been faithful to us as individuals and our families, that he's been faithful to the saints of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The third reason that Daniel is able to praise the Lord, it stemmed from the prophet's understanding of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It unveiled a future that was so good, uh, I'll bet he couldn't help but praise. The rock that, that endures forever and that breaks that statue into a thousand pieces. Um, what is that rock? Who is that rock? King Jesus. And, and through Nebuchadnezzar's dream, God showed Daniel that there is going to come an ultimate triumph of Christ on earth. Is it going to happen during Daniel's lifetime? No, it is not. But Daniel continues to be less about an earthly perspective and more about an eternal perspective. The good guys win. Uh, Justice is coming. Uh, Our eternal salvation is secure. This revelation in the dream wasn't a solution to the current crisis. Daniel and his people were, were still in slavery. God's temple is still in ruins. God's prophet is still in jeopardy in this moment. But still, God displayed his long-range plans to Daniel. Daniel did not know all that was going to happen in his, his immediate circumstances, but God assured him all things were working toward a grand triumph. Uh, so despite his present danger, there are so many examples from the past to inspire our praise. And it turns out there is so much hope in the future for which Daniel could praise God. Trials don't disappear because we praise God, but believers' hearts don't despair when we praise God. Perhaps the bottom has fallen out of someone's life today. You don't know why. You can't imagine any reasonable Uh, explanation. Maybe the problem is finances, a family being torn apart, loved one who is suffering with an illness. Um, How do you face that difficulty? This sounds very self-serving, but part of it begins by you coming here this morning. I'll bet a lot of you didn't want to. And you start opening your mouth and joining in with your brothers and sisters And you offer this sacrifice of praise. And maybe you start thinking of just one good thing God has put in your life right now. Or maybe you remember something good that God has done for you and your family in the past. And you praise Him for that. And then then you thank the Lord in faith for the fact that He will yet do good things in your life. 
Our very own, you know, Paul McLaurin prophesied a few weeks ago. Look around, church. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in you. And it's here in this place. The same spirit dwells in you. Good things are coming. Uh, God has not departed. The best is yet to come. And so this rock made without human hands that would crush the powers of earthly kingdoms revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Jesus shatters the powers of Satan. He takes the penalty for sin on himself in Calvary. And then our Savior rose in victory over death, showing that he had defeated the powers of sin and and believers can be forgiven and we don't live under guilt and shame. And we're children of a king and awaiting his return um, where there will one day be no more tears, no more injustice, no more trials. Our present is bearable because Christ's future glory is so amazing and guaranteed. One more point to make. When the bottom falls out, Daniel shows us this template where we can actually respond in prayer, even praise. But Daniel's response, I don't think, has still reached the most bold counterintuitive expression in the middle of, let's call it an unsympathetic crowd. He actually proclaimed. I wasn't trying to do the preacher thing with the three P's, prayer, praise, proclamation, but it it worked. And, And he proclaimed the greatness of God, not just to his small group prayer circle, you know, not just in his private prayer closet. He proclaimed the goodness of God at the highest levels uh, with the biggest platform amongst the least friendly audience. And so when the king asked Daniel if he could reveal the dream, Daniel made sure that God got all the glory. It's like, it's like God could not be kept from Daniel's lips. And you know what happened as a result? God couldn't be kept from Nebuchadnezzar's mind When Daniel finished interpreting the dream, uh, Nebuchadnezzar not only paid homage to Daniel, uh, but the king honored Daniel's God. He said, the king said to Daniel, truly your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries. Because of Daniel's proclamation, the king knew Daniel's ability was from the God of Israel. The, the proclamation accompany, uh, accompanying Daniel's revelation made the power and the presence of the Lord so real th- that the king wouldn't touch God's prophet. I mean, Daniel's interpretation just openly degraded the future of Babylon and the king. And yet instead of ordering Daniel's execution, um, he feared such an affront You know, Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before the prophet and praised Daniel's God. The king was so humbled that the rage Daniel expected never came. I've noticed this sometimes, you know, that the proclamation itself can be like a supernatural instrument of God. I don't know if some of you know what I'm talking about. Like where he gives you the words to say and you don't even know where they're coming from. Or, or how about this, where the words you use are so mangled and inarticulate, but it doesn't matter. God still works in that person's heart. I've even had this. I'll preach a C minus sermon. I know they're, they're like very rare, <laughs> but it's clearly a C minus. And for some reason, someone will get saved and they'll say, Pastor, when you said that thing, it just broke me, man. Turns out, I never said that thing. God somehow is articulating what that person needed to hear in their heart. It's, it's, how do you explain that? It's a God thing entirely. The powers of this world cannot stand when God is courageously proclaimed by our witness and God's power. Sometimes they will turn toward him And you know what? Sometimes they'll turn away from him. But they are still being forced to contemplate their relation to or lack thereof with the living God through our proclamation. Proclamation of God is like 
It's like preaching to ourselves too. It's a, it's a faith builder. And, and when we learn enough about God or excited enough about God to express him before others, it means we know him well enough to entrust our very lives to him, our family's lives. The heart that overflows with the testimony of God isn't often overwhelmed by the circumstances that they know is already in God's hands. So, instead of me just talking about this, would there be those this morning who would actually be willing to apply this today, to model it for us, to step out and respond and actually publicly proclaim the goodness of God, the goodness of how he's at work in your life and in the world today. Perhaps how he's been faithful and good to you in the past. Or maybe the hope and faith that you have of how you know God will be good and faithful to you in the future.